Welcome to 7.2 U.S. History. Um, the United States creates the Articles of Confederation. Those involved in the creation of the newly formed government of, the Amer of America were of the upper class, and they had just or were in the process of fighting a revolution against a very strong centralized government. And so their natural inclination was to try to create a, a government that has had as little power as possible. And so they created a loose confederation of states rather than a strong centralized government. Um, each state thought of itself as its own individual country and um, had no desire to give up its sovereignty, quote unquote, to uh, create a stronger centralized government. At this point in history, they didn't really see the need for it, but later on they would realize that um, it would be impossible to proceed with or to grow as a country without a stronger centralized government. So on November 17, uh, November 1777, the Articles of Confederation were formally adopted by each state which voted to adopt this type of government. Um, and the Congress was granted powers by the states to do several basic things. They would help to conduct foreign affairs, number one, to conduct foreign affairs. So any time that, the, that America needed to interact with another country, they would go through the Continental Congress. Number two, they would conduct all matters relating to war and peace. And, and they were allowed to maintain an armed force. Um, number three, they could raise loans. They could issue bills of credit. They could establish um, coinage or money. They could regulate trade with the um, Indian peoples. But one significant problem was that they could not tax directly. Number four, it was the final authority when there were disputes between states, especially in regards to um, borders and other issues. Number five, it would create a national postal system. Um, the need for that was acute, and um, the Continental Congress was one of the few bodies that was interstate, so they used the Continental Congress as a way of creating a postal system. They also um, were allowed to create a standardized weight system. Um, there was many different types of weights and measures being used, and the United States mainly adopted the same measuring system as um, England. Um, and finally, all the powers that were not mentioned in this Articles of Confederation were granted to the each state to make laws about those things. So um, everything the the Articles of Confederation government was strictly re restrained to doing only those things that were mentioned within the Articles of Confederation. This was this stipulation was given so that. Um, the Articles of Confederation would stay small, so that the government of the uh, newly formed America would stay small. Um, in order to ratify the Articles of Confederation, they had to wait for um, the small state of Maryland to agree, because it was holding up the it held up the process for up to th for about three years, because it wanted to. Um, uh, work through one of the problems that it saw as being a, a potential danger spot for itself and other small states. There were a few states that had huge amounts of territory in the West, and the, and Maryland wanted those states like Virginia, which had a huge territory in the West, to secede all that territory, and so that it would not be overly powerful and dominate in the government. So it held out until Virginia graciously gave up its western territories in order to adopt a unified government. Um, this happened in 1781. But up until that time, even during those three years of um, stalemate, the Articles of Confederation was still functioning. It just wasn't rati ratified by all the states. So, um, yeah, in 1781... 
Virginia, who had the largest western claim of land, broke the, that stalemate and promised to cede all of its lands to the government. Despite all of these restrictions, the Article, Articles of Confederation government managed to do quite a lot of things. Number one, it was able to finance the war effort, and it did that through several different means. Number one, it grant, it it got grants and loans from several different foreign powers, and one of the largest contributing uh, pa uh, nations was France. And it also gained money through issuing paper currency. So it started to print money. It had a small um, amount of gold and silver um, to back up that currency, but the more currency that it printed, the less gold and silver was backing that currency up. And so this caused inflation. And inflation um, is basically a secret way of taxing everyone um, because all, every time you use that money then, you are having to use more of it to get less benefits. So um, everyone eventually pays more because of that. Um, but it's so it's a uh, secret way of taxing people. The Congress also um, called on the states to begin raising taxes to help um, support the currency that they were producing. But unfortunately, the states were doing the same thing. The states were also printing their own currency. So there were several different types of currency floating around during the Revolutionary War. Um, and this caused a lot of uncertainty economically for the people. The, uh, the growth of the money supply depreciated the value of that currency, and this caused runaway inflation. Um, uh, it may have been that in one week, your va the value of your currency would have um, reduced by half or even more. A, a brilliant man named Robert Morris, who was probably the wealthiest merchant in the Americas at this point, was elected to become the Secretary of Finance in May of 1781. And he did some things that really helped to um, try to stabilize the American economy. Number one, he chartered a bank of North America in Philadelphia, and he deposited a huge amounts of gold and silver, which he had gained through loans from Holland and France. And um, he used that silver and gold to issue... Um, new a new currency, um, and then he also helped that the negotiations um, with Holland and France to supply the Continental Army as well. He also managed to make interest payments on the loans that had already been taken out, which was a, a great feat. So he he really did with the limited amount of power that he had. He managed to help. The, econ the American economy to survive. Another great thing that the um, Continental Congress managed to do under the Articles of Confederation was to negotiate independence. Um, the struggle was trying to get, uh, be treated as an equal sovereign nation by other European countries that had been countries for many, many centuries. So, um, this was a challenge, and the French, when when the end of the war came, were trying to manipulate the negotiations because they had several things on their agenda that they wanted to try to push through. Um, one of the main things being that they wanted to limit the American powers of expansion. They did not want the the Americans to be able or allowed to expand farther west. Um, but in violation of the original treaty that the Americans had made with the French at the beginning of the war, uh, the Americans went into negotiations secretly with Britain um, to end the war without the French's involvement or the, the French involvement. This delighted the Fr the the British um, because it gave the British another opportunity to uh, stick it to the the French. And so they um, they negotiated with the Americans separately without the French knowledge. And the British agreed to, number one, withdraw troops 
from the American territories that the Americans had just recently won. And um, they, they put this clause in there, with all convenient speed, which is up for interpretation. I don't think the Americans realized how um, sneaky that actually was, but the British ended up lingering in, in American territory for quite some time after the war, and this caused a lot of tension. Number two, they guaranteed American rights to take f uh, fish from northern waters, so areas um, uh, that northern um, bank off of the coast of eastern um, Amer North America was open to uh, American fishing. Number three, it gained western territory, territorial boundaries that extended all the way to the Mississippi River. And this um, included travel along the Mississippi River. So both the, the British and the Americans could now use the Mississippi for trade and travel. Now, this seemed like a great solution, but there was one impediment, which we will find out later. Number four, the British received American promises not to try to stop loyalists from uh, attempting to recover some of their lost property during the war. Um, they, um, the British were trying to help the loyalists um, re gain some ba something back from all that they had lost. Unfortunately, a lot of this never actually managed to be um, done. So, and finally, number five, the Americans promised to um, cease confiscating loyalist property. So after the war, they stopped punishing loyalists by taking away their property. When the French heard about the secret negotiations that the Americans had done, the French threatened to make an alliance with the British. I'm sorry, the, the Americans threatened to make an alliance with the British and leave the French out. So the French stopped um, their aggression and they, they just simply negotiated a separate peace treaty with the British. The Spanish, on the other hand, refused to direct directly deal with the Americans and um, they claimed that the same territory that the Americans were claiming after the war. This uh, territory was the Appalachian Mountains and um, parts of northern um, Florida and um, Georgia. But this um, territory remained in dispute for quite some time. And in response to the frustration that the Spanish felt at the end of this war, they closed off the port of New Orleans, uh, which made the navigation of the Mississippi River for trade and travel kind of um, pointless because the whole point of using the Mississippi River was uh, to gain an outlet to um, the other nations through the port of the New Orleans. So um, Spain also negotiated separately with uh, Britain to regain Florida. This whole set of negotiations became known as the Treaty of Paris. So the Treaty of Paris was basically a series of separate treaties among the United States, Great Britain, France, and Spain that were all signed at Versailles, Versailles on September 3rd, 1783. During the two years between the surrender at Yorktown and the signing of the Treaty of Paris, the Continental Army had been kept in a state of warfare alert. So there were about 10,000 men um, training and um, being supported by the Continental Congress. There was a great danger, actually. Well, number one, if the, if the peace treaty did not go through, then, then they would still be needed. But the other danger was that of using military force against uh, the civilian government. There were many disgruntled um, war veterans and um, military men who were hoping to gain more financially out of the war than, than the Continental Congress was at the moment willing to promise. And so um, there was especially one incident where in 1783 
there was a group of officers who felt that they needed to be paid life pensions or at least a bonus of five years of pay, and they threatened to use the military force to gain this from the Continental Congress. But Washington showed just what a great man he was. Um, he used his position to um, defray the tension. So um, they were all congregated together, and he got up to address them. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure if this was on purpose, or maybe it was just um, the luck of, of saying exactly the right thing that he needed to say, but he got out his spectacles, something that they had never seen him do before, and he addressed the crowd saying, gentlemen, you must pardon me. Um, I have grown gray in your service and now find myself growing blind. And then he proceeded to denounce their selfishness and their wish to resort to violence and force in order to gain what they thought they wanted. Um, he was, um, because of his comment about his own sacrifice and his own willingness to go without, um, it really convicted them of their own greediness. And they went away without their um, demands being met at that time. But the Congress, due to Washington's urgings, um, then voted to grant these pensions and these bonuses, after all, without the use of military force. And that's the key, is that military force was not used. Um, this is very, very important to maintaining the uh, ideals of democracy. The Congress also voted the, that the soldiers get three months of extra pay as a bonus, and um, then they also instructed Washington to begin dismissing them. By the beginning of 1784, the Continental Army had shrunk to no more than a few hundred men, and Washington's example of setting up the precedent of the military being subordinate to the civilian authority um, is what has been maintained until today. With the end of the war, there were um, several different problems that ar arose concerning the West. The United States claimed that the victory over Great Britain was also a great uh, victory over the Indians as well, since the Indians had been allies of the British. But many Indians were unwilling to accept this. Many American Indians uh, remained in a state of war for several decades after the uh, Revolutionary War. And during the Revolutionary War, there were many thousands of Americans who were still migrating, um, and they were being attacked by the Native Americans. And um, the British troops encouraged this type of um, warfare because they wanted to uh, keep, first of all, keep the, the settlers busy fighting, fighting Indians so that the British could be free to fight uh, um, American troops. And also, um, they hoped that the vulnerability of these newly created settlements would would make it much easier for the, Ameri for the American Indians to um, destroy them. American leadership saw the West as critical to its continued development as a nation. They, um, and as a result, this was one of the main um, negotiation issues after the war. Spain was uh, extremely f frightened of the expansionistic um, motivations of the Americans, and so as a result, they closed their their port, the New Orleans port, to the Americans, and this made the Mississippi River unusable for the Americans. Um, but this only postponed the uh, the problems that would be later come to fruition in regards to territorial expansion. Um, legislation was created by the Continental Congress and under the Articles of Confederation. It was drafted by Thomas Jefferson, who um, tried to provide for government of the Western territories. 
Um, and the Western Territories ended up being all of the territory that was acquired over during the Revolutionary War that was not a part of the original 13 colonies. All this territory would eventually be divided into states, and um, these states would eventually form uh, have the same rights and privileges as the original 13. This was a very gracious movement move on the on the part of the original 13 and they realized that without this um, there would not be a true equal union of states. Once the population of a territory had reached 20,000 they could begin to create their own self-government. They had to um, draft a constitution and um, the free white men of the uh, when they had reached about 5,000, they could choose an assembly, but the governor that was appointed by the state, by the um, Continental Congress, still had the right of absolute power of veto over all the territorial legislation that this, this um, group of free white males was creating. So once that population of um, that territory had reached the amount of the smallest of the original 13 colonies, or 13 states, then they could petition for statehood from the Continental Congress, um, and they could join the Confederation of United States. Another legislation that was created was something called the Land Ordinance of 1785, and this provided for the survey and sale of Western lands. It divided the land into small squares called townships that had 36 sections of one square mile, which would equal, the total square was equal to about 640 acres each. This land was auctioned off and um, it couldn't go below $1 per acre. So this the money was used then to help um, finance the, the government. Thousands and thousands of settlers chose not to wait for this, the official opening of the Western lands, and many of them settled illegally. The Congress really tried to drive them off using troops, but they just came back, and um, this created uh, quite a big problem, uh, which we will discuss in the next chapter. The Northwest Territory included the future states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin.